from the prophet Joel. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I shall also gather all the nations together and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and there I will enter into judgment against them on account of my people and my inheritance, Israel, who were dispersed among the nations against those who divided my land and who cast lots over my people and traded boys for prostitutes and sold girls for the wine they drank. Indeed, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Philistia, what have you to do with me? Are you paying me back for a grudge you hold against me? If so, I shall return your retaliation swiftly and immediately upon your own head. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and taken my precious possessions into your temples and because you sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the sons of the Greeks in order to exile them far from their borders. Greetings, friends, and welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website can be found at scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives, and that's where you go to support this mission of truth. We are resuming our study in the book of Revelation. And if you're uh, just tuning in, we're looking at the book of Revelation from both the early church perspective, in other words, the perspective of those who received the letter, uh, but we're also considering what this means for us today. And we're ready for chapter 16, 20 verses this morning. Now, chapter 16 deals with the bold judgments. And there's really a couple of views about the Joel, about the bold judgments. And that is, the first view is that it's just, you know, that the seven trumpets and the seven bulls, they're, they're really the same thing, just different vantage points of understanding. Uh, or there's another view, probably the one I'm more inclined to uh, lean towards, which is that they're similar but the trumpet plagues were really more of a warning and a call to repentance. But as we're going to see, the people refused. And now the bold judgments are the final wrath of God being poured out upon the earth. And so that would be the difference between the sorrows. You have the beginning of sorrows to a final judgment. And uh, so that is the view that I would probably hold myself. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So chapter 16, open up your hearts. Let's see what the word of God has to say to us this morning. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and he poured out his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So please note, the first bowl is that those who took the mark are now having a reaction to it and it's causing them to break out in great sores. So many, so many possibilities with this, right? I could see this. You know, I've thought that this might have a genetic component to it, genetic manipulation, and based on what we've seen in the last few years, uh, but that would not be surprising. And as a result, this image, this mark that they take, whatever form it's in, we just know what it's for, right? It's an allegiance to the beast, to the system. It's something you have to have. You have to align yourself with the beast, worship his image, take this mark. Otherwise, you can't even do commerce, can't buy, sell, can't do anything. Well, the result will be... and. T- 
I'm going to I'm going to avoid the temptation to make too many comparisons to what's ha- transpired over the last few years. But you don't have to use your imagination too far to see this connection, do you? The result of taking this mark is not only your own eternal damnation according to the scriptures, but there'll also be a a foul and loathsome sore that'll come upon these people. Let's continue on. Verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood of as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given to them to drink blood, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So the third bowl, really you have the second and the third bowl pretty much accomplish the same thing, right? And that is uh, all the waters being turned to blood. So you have the sea being turned to blood, and as a result, whatever makes this happen will cause every living creature in the sea to die. It says every living creature. So the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. It became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. But then there's another bowl, bowl three, poured out on the rivers and springs of water so that they also become blood. So it would appear that there's there's the... the, uh, Clean, drinkable, usable water is pretty much going to be gone. Sea life is going to be dead. And the reason for this judgment, it says very clearly, because an angel proclaims it, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and is to be, because you have judged these things. What was the reason for turning all this to blood? For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. So that is the purpose of that judgment. I don't think, you know, we read this, but we don't really see how severe the implications of this are. A majority of the world is probably going to take the mark, right? So they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to have this foul and loathsome sores on their skin. Additionally, there's going to be no sea life. The the seas will be going to be turned to blood, and even the rivers and springs are turned to blood. There's probably you know, so there's going to be a very, very lack, a shortage, if you will, of drinkable, usable water. This is horrible times, but they're getting their just due, according to the scriptures here. The angel saying, "It is this is what they deserve, because they shed the blood of the saints and the blood of the prophets." And the angel says, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Let's get to the fourth bowl. Verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. So bowl four is intense, unbearable heat. Now this is going to be magnified beyond what we probably can comprehend. Um, One of my favorite places to visit is Arizona. And when you get into Phoenix from flying from the Midwest, it's a... The heat can be a shock, depending on what time of year it is you get there. I mean, there's times when people's trash cans are melting in the front. You know, in front of their house. Like, the literal trash bin is melting. That's hot, but 
you know, for the most part, you can find ways to tolerate it. This is going to be unbearable heat. Unbearable. It's scorching men, and it's going to be specifically coming from the sun, according to this, according to the scriptures here. They're saying that the bowl is poured out on the sun itself. And now men are being scorched with fire. And the people of the earth at this point in time, they know where the judgments are coming from. Think about Egypt, right? Moses is telling Pharaoh what's going to happen if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And the plagues follow. And, you know, the whole time the people are aware that it's Jehovah God who is bringing down the plagues upon them. Likewise, during this time, the people know it is the one true God of the universe who's doing this. And it says they don't care. They're under these unbearable circumstances. They're broken out with sores. There's no water. It's all turned to blood. Now they're being scorched with fire by the sun. And it says that they just double down and blaspheme the name of God who has power over the plagues and did not repent and give him glory. They just foam at the mouth even more. It's not hard for me to imagine. Because I see this today with a lot less. Where people never want to take responsibility for the, for the fact that their backyard is on fire. And that the world that they live in is crumbling. It's always somebody else's fault. They're just mad at everybody else. They're never going to pull back on their sin or their perversions or their filth no it's somebody else's fault so even in the midst of the end of the world that's still their posture and their attitude let's look at bowl 5 verse 10 then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. So some type of plague is poured out on the kingdom of the beast itself, on the throne of the beast. And now things have gotten even darker, even more evil, even more painful. They're chewing their own tongues because of the sores and the pains and all of this. But again, just like with bowl four, they just blaspheme God because they know he's doing it to them and they do not repent of their deeds. All right, let's look at bowl six, verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl in the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw their unclean spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together to the place in Hebrew, Armageddon. So the sixth bowl is the final battle of Armageddon, which we read more about here uh, towards the end of, this, of, the, of the book of Revelation. The thing that really jumps out to me that I just find interesting is, I mean, it's what we assume, but it's just nice. It's just really great to see the Bible kind of com confirm these things. The power that the beast and the false prophet, the power that they have is demonic power, which we assume, right? But it, it says right here, and then the, those spirits that are empowering them to perform signs before men, they go out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. And it says, for they are spirits of demons. And what do these spirits of demons do? They perform signs. And it kind of, these signs that people follow, and it leads them to gather 
together into the great day of Armageddon. The great day of the Lord. Interesting also, um, Jesus, you hear the words, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. This is not complicated. We know what watching is, right? Paying attention, looking for the king. And keeping your garments is walking in the way. That's what it means to keep your garments, keep your garments clean, keep them spotless. Blessed are those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ according to the book of Revelation. It's it's walking in the way of the Lord and watching for him, lest he come like a thief. It's like the wise virgins standing in readiness for the bridegroom to come at midnight. It's this diligence to be remain vigilant to watch and be ready. And of course, the Christian garment is always described as, you know, like this baptismal robe, the garment of righteousness. Interesting thing to note, Armageddon, uh, which also means the hills of Megiddo. And the nearest hill to Megiddo is Mount Carmel. And if you remember, Mount Carmel is where Elijah confronts the prophets of Baal. You can go check that out in the book of Kings. Interesting note, the same final conflict taking place right there. And you got the evil spirits and that are leading mankind against God. So they blaspheme his name, refuse to repent, and now they're going to gather together to come against God. It's, it's madness, but look at the world we're living in. The whole world has gone mad. Absolute insanity. The percentage of people that are completely insane, who are in positions of power, who are, in, and who are teaching your kids at school, and the list goes on and on, is, is shocking, and yet... It's happening, so do not be surprised about what we're reading here. We're almost done. Let's look at bowl 7. Verse 17, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And these were noises and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and a great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague and of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Interesting. Uh, by the way, uh, about the weight of a talent, we're talking potentially 75 pound hail. Can you even fathom 75 pound hail? This is insane. We don't truly appreciate the magnitude of this. But, in, but the people living on the earth during this time, they're going to appreciate it. Because it's the worst things that have ever happened. It says that this, is, this great earthquake is the, a mighty great earthquake. Nothing like it has occurred since man was on the earth. There's never been one to compare to what's going to happen. It's going to be so big that it's going to divide the great city. I believe in this instance it's talking about Jerusalem. Could be wrong, but I believe it's talking about Jerusalem. It's going to divide it in pieces. And then it says, and God remembered Babylon. And that's what we're going to get to next week. It almost seems like Babylon in some way is surviving these plagues a little better than maybe the rest of the world. We'll have to see, because there's some special judgment for Babylon. 
And if there is a topic that I have covered more than any topic over the last 11 years, it is this one. And you can find probably half a dozen episodes on my YouTube channel already where I have talked about Great Babylon. It is the thing that got me to start doing this podcast. And chapter 17 isn't very long. We're going to do that next week. And I'll talk more about that when we get to it. But the next two weeks that will be the topic. We have the great harlot and her beast. And then chapter 18 deals with the, with the full judgment of Babylon. I pray that you've been blessed this morning and strengthened. Behold, I come as a thief, he says. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Thank you for listening, my friends. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.